Thank you, Khalid. Today is a very special day for me. I sit on the same table as my professors and my fellow students. And uh, this has been a long marathon for me from 1977 when I started my MA till now when I'm part of a table where I'm co-panelist with my professors and my group highs. I want to express gratitude to all of them for being with me all the time. Uh, I am like a, I, like a true student, I'll follow the text. And I'll try and say uh, what I understand from Professor Obroy's work, uh, The Mind in Society. I read the book with a curiosity to find out what is it that Professor Obroy is really concerned with, the kind of questions that he wants to uh, work with and the kind of research method that he uses to answer these questions. And I discovered that the most important question with him is that what is intellectual self-reliance as theory, method and practice within and without the university? Uh, this to me is uh, a non-dualist, non-violent uh, theory of intellectual self-reliance. Uh, and the dualism is expressed in the fellowship between intellectual self-reliance and the pursuit of truth. He has convincingly argued that one cannot exist without the other. That is to say, if you want to pursue truth, you have to forego the pursuit to power. And if intellectual self-reliance is a mode of being in the world, then of necessity, you will come to understand the pursuit of truth. And I think it is worth considering on this basis, uh, he suggests in his work, that this is the foundation of a studentship within and without the university. It is the foundation of a sensible, meaningful conversation on questions of freedom of expression, transformative social action, and social justice. It also guides students how to read, write, and be reflexive. It guides our modes of livelihood. And it teaches us how to be respectful to people who are different and who oppose you. To not lose our alertness and enhance our capacities to be reasoned, abled human beings. And finally, this fellowship has possibly the capacity to pull us out of the fatigue and exhaustion that is discernible from the many posts that dot the intellectual landscape today, such as postmodern, post truth, post development, and post development and post colonial. I have taken three sets of ideas from his work to sort of give you a glimpse of the depth and extent of what Professor Obero is trying to say. The first is from uh, The Other Mind of Europe. He says, it is no solution to propose to wait until we should ourselves become European. And he suggests further, to do this, India as a culture area will be nowhere in the world of knowledge, the sciences and the arts if it does not first defy, the word is defy, the European monopoly of the scientific method as established in modern times, and to do so, it is necessary to organize non-standard modes of knowledge and other principles of relation of knowledge to life, whether European or non-European. And finally, he says, the discussion of truth is concerned, amongst other things, with the theory of the name. And here, the universe of discourse is constituted with three terms, God, man, and nature, not to be discussed in isolation of each other, or at the expense of each other, but as a unity and in solidarity. It is argued in mind and society that this task of not waiting until we become Europeans ourselves, I quote, is essentially one in order to reconcile our two institution modes of learning, the imported institutional mode and the inherited national tradition, which have been unhappily segregated so long to the point of intellectual self-estrangement. And here, intellectual self-reliance is a word which is not simply home rule or swaraj in, inter in internal and external life of a nation and intellectual institutions. It is not a question of relying solely on homegrown or Swadeshi ideas or formulating rituals, rules of purity and pollution of international intellectual relations. The overcoming of this intellectual estrangement is suggested can be course of learning the following. If we observe in everyday life, various languages 
at the speaker's command complement one another and no single one of them is expected to fulfill all the functions of everyday communication and also to discover how people develop ways of speaking in which they can maintain their own language and still communicate with speakers of other languages this studentship navigates the path of learning to not fall victim to a total rejection of ideas that are imported on the one hand and not to glorify the national based on rules of purity and pollution in the world of ideas the contours of this studentship emerge when to not wait until we become our europeans ourselves prompts an inquiry of what does it entail to become what does it entail to become what power regimes of power want us pushed to be and who am i as the one who is engaged in inquiry with these questions it becomes possible to attempt to organize knowledge systems within and without the university with regard to the question who am i as the one who is engaged in inquiry patanjali has something very interesting to say in his yoga sutra when he says chitt vritti nirodaha which is to say that you have to have an equipoise you have to be unwavering like a flame flame of a candle in the face of a storm to understand to not be lured by power and the pursuits of power i learned something very different and perhaps complemented to what patanjali says in the course of my phd with professor oberoi professor oberoi suggested to me that i should learn a new language a language which is not a part of my socialization or of the academic discourse that i really study in a university and that this language needs to be learned without an interpreter a commentator or an informant or a translator and finally to learn to be with ideas until they mature in the same way as a mango or a papaya would mature from a fruit and fall off and not be have to be plucked it took me 2 years at least 2 years to learn the language of koitors of shringar bhum in bastar chatisgarh i discovered that the context the bilingual context was a necessary condition for me to engage with the question who am i as the one engaged in inquiry in relationship to koitors knowledge to life these three suggestions from professor obroy were in fact conditions for me to become intellectually self aligned to find out how best this inquiry can be conducted as part of a social interaction with people who are willing to learn a different language because they are they have command over their own i discovered each one of them all my koitor friends knew at least four languages these languages are spoken by people of communities they lived by and i also discovered that it is customary in them to to honor the word and that it is because they honor the word that they have this bilingual capacity to learn more than one language my koitor's friend taught me that if you are the one who is engaged in inquiry then the belongings that you have should not weigh more than you can carry this inquiry generates requires huge amount of energy and stamina to reinvent yourself multiple times and to reincarnate yourself many times in one lifetime this is because we have internalized into a conscious subconscious and unconscious the desire to become european or to become what national powers want us to be and to overcome this desire it will take many times many lives within one lifetime to at least understand what the problem is such studentship also defies not only european monopoly of the scientific method but any effort to monopolize the world among peers family members and institutions within a nation and across nations professor obra suggests to defy it is necessary to uphold the validity of learning from other non standard marginalized modes of relationship of knowledge to life he once said in a conversation to me and to i think most of his students sitting in delhi school of economics cafeteria one must choose one adversaries with caution it is an opportunity to learn it will involve a considerable investment of time and energy not everyone is worthy of being an adversary in the course of engagement with adversaries it becomes possible to form up the ground on which one stands defiance comes not with the question who will decide what the terms of reference are instead it comes with the question what are these terms of reference professor obra suggests these are three terms god man and nature 
because with these terms it becomes possible to bring diverse knowledge systems into a conversation with each other. These three terms are not to be understood in isolation but as solidarity because these are the foundations of faith, morality and lifestyle in a civil society which is not an extension of the state where it is customary practice, where the customary practice to honor the word and stand by the word is the ruling force and not natural instinct or universal reason. This civil society, your Professor Obra argues, nurtures bilingual plural social structures and knowledge system, nurtures non-estranged labor that integrates human and non-human nature, enriches love, respect and compassion for all. The word is worthy of honor because it represents a necessary relation between sound and sense, between light and sound, between the eyes and the ears, and between what one says and what one does. Most significantly, Professor Lubrez argues, name by itself is an original word which possesses more power and efficiency than the person, God, who is so addressed in names. And finally, I want to conclude by saying, I want to suggest Eklavya as an exemplar who demonstrates this theory of the name. Having been denied admission by Dronacharya to his school of archery on the ground that he was not of appropriate caste, he made a statue of him and remembered the name and learned archery to become better than Arjun, who, Dronacharya, who was Dronacharya's foremost student. Not only this, Eklavya did not hesitate a moment to give his thumb when Dronacharya asked for it as Guru Dakshina. With this depth of commitment and dedication for the name, he earns more esteem than Arjun. And yet, no regime of power has appropriated him as an icon, and perhaps they cannot. The subject of contemplation here and discussion here is, how can we find in a club's studentship and expression and representation of the solidarity between God, man, and nature? Thank you. I think we'll go straight on because time is short. Um, I want to briefly, I can't talk about the book because it's uh, very big and it's going to take me a while to really internalize it. Uh, what I'll talk about is what I read off as one chapter in the book and uh, uh, I'll then talk about what I think is uh, sort of distinctive to uh, G. Dubroy's uh, practice that is of inhabiting the library and what that means and what it means to me. Meetings with him as his doctoral student, uh, G. Dubroy asked me, what is it that you are doing today that can't be postponed until tomorrow? The short and long answer was nothing. This occasion, however, is not a day too soon, and one can only applaud Khalid's indefatigable efforts in midwifing mind and society into book form. These essays will not be received in the mode of postponement, because rather than marking the completion of a certain thought, they open up new explorations, and none more so than in holding to a fidelity to method. This commitment to method is complemented by a practice elevated to a habit of being present in the library, whatever the library is. One small point as far as method is concerned, and here I try and read it in reference to a particular paper on naming, which I think is a remarkable one. If you read chapter 18 on the metaphysics of Indian modernity, O'Broy mentions that in its vernacular form, this metaphysic rests on hearing the name of the divine in the heart, thus invoking a presence through a form of intersubjective address. The name here is an invocation, a calling out, by which the transcendent becomes interior to the addresser. The name thus is the prime example of the collapse of the dual, the inside and outside, the material and the ethereal, subject and object. Rather than consider the name as pure immanence and intention, this essay, at least for me, allows me to think of it as an absent interiority to be filled in at once by the corporeal and the spiritual, and this is for me very important. This method of treating the proper noun as a combination allows us to escape the illusions of manifest or latent structure. Indeed, structure, as this is my takeaway, uh, alone allows us to think of irregularity, showing to us the patterns that compose it. The name, of course, is this pattern, at least in vernacular modernity, as he elaborates it in that particular essay. Of all my teachers, Jitu Baroy is distinctive in his absolute commitment to being present in the RTL. 
Ever since I can remember, he has been prowling the library, which I suspect for him is a world complete and uncompletable, filled with secrets such as censuses recording how many houses are made of mud and grass, or how many basket weavers and high tanners reside in each village in UP or Kashmir. But this is no cabinet of curiosities. I remember him telling me that the library breathes, exhaling books in great clouds. The trick is to understand how breath is ordered through a principle of classification, what he once called, if I'm not mistaken, habzidam, the training of breath. Once trained, the library is habit, simultaneously addictive, and a call to grace, and I can think of no better exemplary figure than Jeet Oberoi being a part of uh, the RTL. For that, I'm ever grateful. Thank you. I must confess I was a bad student. I'm not quite sure he even got along with Jeet. But I discovered Jeet in a strange way. By bunking class, I decided to go to a movie. I think it was Golmal. It sort of took time to start. And the Sardar next to me was getting restless. And at that moment, Amitabh Bachchan jumps from the balcony. And the Sadar is totally excited. He smacks my leg and says, Ben Cho, the Asli Maal aya hai. <laughs> I think for me, Jeet Singh Abura was the Asli Maal of Indian sociology. But now I'll quarrel with him. Uh, I think many people read Jeet as a text. And I think it's one of my younger friends who told me, don't read him as a text. Read him as a graphic novel. Because he was the most animated figure in Indian sociology. And he was part cartoon, part caricature, part text. For me, Jeet Singh Abura is the informal sociology. I can't see Jeet separate from Ramu Gandhi, Nirmal Verma, and Vinadas. And by the way, they were all brilliant outside class. If you really wanted to grasp the gossip of sociology, it was a D school canteen. The MA classes were painful. <laughs> and you know, it's a kind of official secret that they were interesting. Not really. But Jeet outside was a tremendous gossip. I'm amazed at his respectability. <laughs> you know, the first thing he actually told me to read was he said, read Karl Marx's economic and political manuscripts. You'll understand film fare better. He had that sense, because he was one of the few people who understood the semiotics of Marx, not just the politics of Marx. And I remember, you know, if you really want to understand Jeet, you have to follow a rite of passage. Jeet is a painful rite of passage. And I want to talk about two rites of passage, which I think every anthropologist had to do to survive Jeet. One, go to Kamlanagar and look at all the shops and come back with an understanding of Katie Mirza. If you couldn't do it, Jeet would wallop the hell out of you. And the other was to walk through Chandrin Chowk with Jeet. In fact, today, if contributions were ever to pay a tribute, I would say we should have a special issue on Kamla Nagar's Chole Bhature and a walk through Chandrin Chowk. Because it is around walking that I discovered Jeet Oberoi. It's around walking you also discovered is absolutely insane dog barf. But one can't think of one without the other. Because to me, Jeet is a composite of memories. In fact, he's half fiction. In fact, I dumped Jeet years later and disappeared to other countries. But I've, what I found interesting was you need a different kind of ekalavya. You need an ekalavya who reinvented Jeet for yourself. And I reinvented Jeet many times, and I can tell you he was much more fascinating. <laughs> because what Jeet actually showed is that sociology is a collection of possibilities. That sociology allows for alternative imaginations. That sociology demands a different kind of storyteller. And I think I want to emphasize this Jeet. I think he's getting too much to be a hermeneutic. He has to be reduced back to context. Because the real thing about Jeet was, he was great fun. And I can't think of Delhi school, which had more fun than when Veena, Jeet, Ramu, who used to bunk philosophy classes and give the lectures in the D school canteen. They were brilliant. You learnt informally. 
And in fact, the informal sociology of Jeet Rinh really fascinates me. He was fantastic in the canteen. I can't, don't know how he was in class. I didn't attend most of it. <laughs> but I think also what is fascinating is the way he looked at things. You know, everyone talks about Bruno Latour's laboratory life. I think Jeet lived that concept years before Latour discovered it. I think Latour discovered it. Jeet invented it. And I think it taught me a lot. Because I think the best way I could... You know, Jeet's a difficult character. I mean, everyone made him sound smooth as silk. <laughs> huh? But I think the real rite of passage is, how do you outgrow Jeet? You can't have a Delhi school of economics which couldn't outgrow Jeet. Because then you understood Jeet. And in transcending the challenges he gave you, you discovered yourself and Jeet in a different world. And I remember the moment I realized this. He used to make casual comments which were fascinating. And one of them was the difference between economics and sociology. You know, when I did sociology, it was just a kind of superior home science. And then the emergency came and economics disappeared. You know, you could almost see Shukma Chakravarti sulking in one corner. Because suddenly the emergency showed that epistemically and ethically, economics didn't make sense. And sociology offered a world of possibilities. And I think a man who helped create that, along with Ramu and Veena and others, was Jit. He was impossible. But I think being impossible made things possible. Thanks to Jeet, I met a whole range of characters. C.V. Seshadri, K.J. Shah, Rajni Kothari. And the beautiful thing about all of them was, God, I don't think they ever agreed on anything. But the way they quarreled made life fascinating. And for the first time you realized that quarrels, debates could be a part of sociology. That sociology and academics were not about impeccable behavior and table manners. And I think that's really what I owe to Jeet. But let me push it further. I think he was fascinating. In fact, I would say he was the most fascinating gossip in Indian sociology. But I think what he did was he raised gossip to the level of epistemology. <laughs> and I think it comes out beautifully when you look at the, uh, for the sociology of India debate and contributions. Fascinating. I wish someone would revive it. And there Jeet opened out a world which went beyond what Srinivas dreamt of. You see, if you op cut open Srinivas's brain, you'll find Evans Pritchard and Rattler Brown written in it. <laughs> if you cut open Jeet's brain, you'll find Max Gluckman and uh, Vic Turner written on it. But what he did was, he took these two guys and transformed them into different worlds. He could understand socialism. He could understand communism. But he also saw them with a certain sense of... He was a kind of imp. But he wouldn't face up to the fact he was impish. He was wicked. Playful. And that way you learnt a certain sociological style. You learnt you could actually walk around with Weber and Durkheim. But you could also understand what was happening in India. And I think one of the great movements of D-School for me was how it took sociology and applied it to the understanding of the emergency. That epistemic movement, that philosophical movement, that movement when you realize that dignity was more important than human rights, I think made Jeet a very interesting figure. And I think he lived his sociology. I remember once there was a cyclone in Delhi University. I think he was the only one who did simultaneously a philosophy of it, an ethnography of it, and for once, without, he's not a very practical guy, he actually helped with the relief operations. It was fascinating to watch. And beautiful to learn. But you also have to understand that he was a regular Punjab match. If you think you could have been polite with him and engaged in etiquette, you were doomed. You had to fight with him. But the way you fought with him taught you how to theorize about sociology. In fact, in, fact, in many ways, he is the man with the biggest comparative perspective. Who would read Marx? 
the modern university, who would read Afghanistan, Melanesia? Look at the West, the defeated West, the other West. In fact, it's very interesting that a lot of people take these books. I remember when I was in South Africa, post-apartheid, and one of them came and said, hey, this one Indian sociologist is very interesting. And he took out an old, chewed-up version of science and culture. I said, this is the book you should read. This makes sense after the apartheid regime. So I said, what makes sense in the book? Just to be perverse. He said, color. Color is about freedom. Color is about racism. Color is about science. And I wish the Indian national movement had a better notion of color than Khadi. He said, it needed a touch of the erotic, Khadi. I think Jeet was fascinating that way. Full of hypotheses, which people invented and pretended they belonged to him. But I think that's what makes this man fascinating. He's responsible for some of the most fascinating footnotes in sociology. By a whole group of Ekalavyas, who invented it, pretending there was Jeet Opuroi. It's a fascinating exercise. And an enjoyable one, provided you are 10 miles away from him. <laughs> Thank you. Since uh, Professor Obora has been looking at his watch, and I know that his stamina is limited, I would suggest that we uh, go outside for uh, refreshments and tea and use that as an opportunity for discussion and exchange.